Go in your Bibles with me. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. We're in our study of this letter. Paul to the Corinthians, called to be saints. If I was to ask you, what is, uh, what is the most foolish thing you've ever done? Now, we won't stay here for a long time because we could probably be here till uh, next Christmas discussing all of the foolish things that... You know, if we put it all together that we have done in our lifetime, uh, I've done some uh, I've done some stupid things, done some foolish things. I remember a time when I saw the ant hill in our backyard, and I thought, you know what? I need to take care of this ant hill. What do you do to take care of an ant hill? I got gasoline and matches. That's what you do until your dad sees you, <laughs> and he comes in a, a gear I didn't know that lawnmower had after me, uh, telling me, "What am I doing?" Whose son are you? And uh, what are you thinking? Don't do that. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of things that we can think about and decisions that we have made. Uh, maybe, maybe some of you have been fooled by someone else. Someone else has deceived you. You trusted them and they took advantage of that trust and you feel uh, hurt by that. You're hurt by that. You're um, quite confused at times by that. It's one thing when someone else deceives us, but it's a whole nother ball game when we are the ones fooling our own selves. And you see the title of the message today is A Fool for Christ. And when we study this chapter, we're going to find out that really everybody's a fool. It just depends on who you are a fool for. Last week's sermon we're going to rightly understand our role. And in this section, Paul is using different examples, different analogies. He said, you as a church, you are God's field. You are God's building. And last week we saw you are God's temple. And so, community, what tool was your choice of use this week? What did you use? Did you use a tool that builds up or did you use the tool that destroys and tears down? You say, well... I'm not really part of that. Yes, you are. You say, well, no, I just sit back and I let other people do the building or other people do the tearing down. I'm praying and my aim is that each one of you will say, God, you have given me grace. You have given me salvation. So with the remaining days, months, years of my life, Fasten my hand to a tool and let me serve you in whatever capacity in your church, building your field, your building, your temple. And may we be used by the Lord to help people who are prone to pick up this one and say, why would you do that? What are you doing? Why are you destroying what Christ had died for? Do more than just say, I'll pray for you. Recognize it's one or the other. That people are either used by God to build his work or they're a tool of Satan to destroy his work. Whose workman are you? This morning we come to 1 Corinthians 3 and we're going to look at verses 18 through 23. And Paul leads off this section and we're going to see how this section ties into the whole introduction of his letter. He says, let no one deceive himself. The problem is in Corinth, they were deceiving themselves. They were absolutely buying a lie. They were living foolishly in the church. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world, this is a passing wisdom, the world is passing away. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, you might underline that, he grounds his teaching in Scripture in the Old Testament. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, 
For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Believers, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Father, open your word to us today. Change us by your word. Father, it is my prayer that every person here will clearly hear and understand the gospel and will embrace the gospel and then live out their lives understanding how much you have done for us in Christ. Don't let anyone leave deceived today, Lord. But may our eyes be wide open to the truth of who Jesus is and the truth of your word and that Jesus is the word made flesh. Thank you for each one that's here. May our hearts be open to hear what you have to say to us. For Jesus' sake, amen. On the back of your worship guide, there's a place if you'd like to jot down the notes. Uh, it's provided for you if that's helpful for you. We're going to see four exhortations that Paul gives to the church at Corinth. Two are warnings. He gives two warnings, and then he gives two amazing encouragements. What, you know, you need both. If you're coaching, you need correction. No, 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 I don't want you to do it this way. But here, if you go this way, hey, we're going to put some points on the board and maybe we can get out of the loss category, all right? So listen to me, work together as a team. So Paul gives two warnings and then he gives two encouragement. The first warning is this, do not be fooled by the deceptiveness of human wisdom. Do not be fooled by the deceptiveness of human wisdom. He writes, let no one deceive himself. Here we can see the problem of truth being hidden from a person. Everybody else can see it, but they can't see it. Have you ever been in a situation like that, that everybody else can understand what's going on, but not that person? That's what Paul is saying is going on here in Corinth. Our hearts will easily lead us astray. So contrary to the whole motif of Disney, do not trust your heart. We teach our kids in Awana, Jeremiah 17, 9. And I praise God for each of you who serve in children's ministry, in youth ministry, in Awana. The heart is deceitful above all things and sort of kind of wicked, desperately wicked. Who can know it? The, nurse, the next verse answers, God knows. Our heart is deceitful. Our heart lies to us. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 3. This is an evil. In all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to us all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. I'm not sure if you want to use that on next year's Christmas card or not, or a screensaver. But it's a pretty bleak outlook on, wow, has humanity gone south? So isn't it true that we think and we look at our nation and we look at the world and we say, boy, it is just awful. And if we could just go back to the good old days the way it used to be. Um, that's Solomon looking around saying it's bad. It's really bad. And what people do to one another is really awful. What's wrong with us? The answer, our heart. It's not other people. It's in here. Matthew 15, verses 18 through 20. You can turn there and look at it in your Bible. Jesus, uh, the Pharisees, they're always after Jesus. Oh, you broke our rule, Jesus. You know, we've got the fence of the law. And you, your disciples, they didn't, need, they didn't properly wash their hands, Jesus. What are you going to say about that, legalists? Always, and they start out with something for personal holiness, and they end up, it's laws for everybody to keep. That's these individuals. Matthew 15, verse 18. Jesus is talking to them, and he says he's teaching them, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. 
What did Jesus do? He took their whole legalistic rule, their fence of the law that they fell in love with more than the law of God, and he junked it. Oh, your disciples didn't wash their hands a certain way. They were hungry. They were walking through the field. They were in ministry. They're trying to keep up with Jesus. They pluck grains of head off, you know, the field. They, they shuck it, blow the chaff, pop kernels in their mouth. And there are the Pharisees, foul, throwing the laundry on the field. They didn't wash their hands ceremonially properly. They're not clean. Jesus, you don't want to mess with us. And Jesus absolutely obliterates their argument. He says, oh, actually, your heart is the issue. Not if you eat with dirty hands. Good thing, because I was a boy once, and I ate with dirty hands all the time. I can't tell you how many times I came to the table, and my mom said, did you wash your hands? Oh, yeah. Let me see them. Go try again. Get back in there. This time, use soap. Oh, soap. These Pharisees were self-deceived. They thought, we are so much better than them because oh, they're eating without washing their hands. Panic. Call the religious police on them. And Jesus is saying, you guys just don't get it. It's here that the problem lies. Not here what you eat. You're making a big to-do about nothing, and you're missing the elephant in the room, the real issue. Now, in the Christmas story, we, we see if someone's deceived. So if I'm self-deceived, that, that's a real problem. But sometimes others deceive. And remember Herod, the wise men come from the east. They come to Jerusalem. They're going everywhere. Uh, we've heard of him who's born king of the Jews. If you know where he's at, you know where he's at. The king of the Jews. We're looking for the king of the Jews, king of the Jews. They're going around Jerusalem. And they're like, you better go talk to Herod. And by the way, his title is king of the Jews. And he fought a three-year war to earn, to earn that title, to win that title and to win that does he know about the king of the Jews thing you're on about? They show up at Herod's place and he says, king of the Jews, excuse me, um, that's me. No, 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 not you. There's one born. We've seen his star in the east. We've come to worship him, not you. So he goes to the Jewish people, the ones who should have been looking for the king, Messiah. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. something about Bethlehem. He'll be in Bethlehem. So what does Herod do? He goes back to the wise men, the king anointers, the magi, and he says, um, well, here's the deal. Bethlehem, the house of David, that's where you're going to find this one. And you go and find him, and when you find him, you come and tell me that I may worship him also. So the magi leave. They bring the gifts to the Christ child in the house. No longer in the stable. They're in the house. They bring, they adore, they worship him. They give sacrificially to him. And then they're warned in a dream. Don't go back to Herod. He doesn't want to come worship. He wants this child dead. So they're warned. They go home to their country another way. And what happens to old Herod? Are the Magi back yet? No, nope, they haven't seen him. Hmm. Is their entourage coming yet? No. Hmm. Go check and see if they're still in Bethlehem. Go find them. They're not there. And what happens to him? They've deceived me. So here's what happens. Everybody in Bethlehem, every newborn boy, two years and under, dies. Because you deceived me. His anger is borne out. Murder, it's from the heart. Who's going to take my throne, my title? Not under my nose, you won't. But Joseph is warned. Mary, they flee to Egypt and Jesus is with them and God cares for them and they're protected. They're saved, they're delivered. But this man's anger and hatred by being deceived, they deceived me, it results in the, in the murder of so many baby boys in Bethlehem. In Scripture, we're warned of those who would mislead us. I mean, just think about this. Would someone mislead you in the name of God? Would somebody on TV with a really big Bible, I mean, would they really mislead people? Yeah, all the time. All the time. Paul warned the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11.3, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, the gospel, 
oh, but wait, you need to do this, and you got to add that. It's not uh, no longer about the gospel. It's about all these other things. Legalists add to the gospel. Paul warned the Ephesians about deceivers in Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Paul had to warn the Thessalonians because there were people saying, Oh, the coming of the Lord, we've missed it. It's already happened. You missed it. There will be people probably knocking on your door this week. And they believe the coming of the Lord has already happened and you just missed it. But they will help you and guide you through their religious program and they'll get you back on track. Paul says, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed and the son of perdition. You're not going to miss that day. You're not going to know. Did you know the day of the Lord happened? You're not going to need that messenger. Everyone will know that day. God will make that perfectly clear. But then James, the half-brother of Jesus, he writes and warns about a danger of self-deception. Not someone like Herod was deceived by the wise. You didn't come back and tell me. Or someone has deceived you. There's a danger that James warns of in James 1.26. And he says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious. It's almost very close to what Paul is saying. Seems to be wise in this age. There has an appearance of wisdom. There has an appearance, James says, of being religious. He says, and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. It's empty. It's pointless. They don't bridle their tongue. They keep all the laws, but they don't bridle their tongue. James says, that's a person whose religion is pointless. And they have deceived themselves. How, How would you deceive yourself? Listen, you take your checkbook, you write in there this afternoon, you know, Christmas is, you got shopping to do, expenses are tight, bills are going up, it's getting colder, cranking the heat up in your house. So you put in your checkbook a deposit for $1 million. Kids, a million dollars. Woohoo, Dad! Let's go shopping. Let's go on vacation. Let's go. Oh, gifts for everybody. Problem. The money's not there. You wrote it in your checkbook. But that's not what the bank says. And they're going to be following up with you real quick and shutting you down. And you're going to look to be a fool. And you could take your little register into the bank and say, but look, it says right here, a million dollars I deposited on the 18th. They're going to be checking out. I'm not sure if we want to keep this person's account because they're operating foolishly. They're missing some basics. Something's not right. In the multitude of counselors, the Bible says we find safety, Proverbs 24, 6. I had a professor in college who just beat home in our heads. What does the Bible say? He would write it on the chalkboard. Dr. Sewell, what does the Bible say? And with every question, with everything we do, what does the Bible say? With anything we interacted with in the class, what does the Bible say? Biblical counsel will always be superior to our traditions, to our feelings, and to our opinions. And this principle is Most basic in Christian discipleship. When we take this text, when I prepare these sermons, I go through observation, interpretation, application. Observe, what has God said? Paul wrote, he wrote to the Corinthians. Why did he write to them? What did he say? What does God mean? And we interpret that then. What is he saying? Why is he saying it? What are they dealing with? What's going on? What's the sin? What do they believe wrongly? How are they acting in a wrong way? Let's interpret that. Then we come to... So in light of who God is, in light of what God has said, in light of truth, how then should I live? As a young person, how should you live? If you're married, how do you live out this reality in a marriage? At work, school, wherever you may be. Because of truth. Because of what God has said. Observation, interpretation, and then we apply it. This is the so what of Bible study. So Paul says, let no one deceive himself. Don't be fooled. The second exhortation that he gives is humbly embrace the foolishness of God's wisdom. Wait a second. 
I thought we weren't supposed to be fooled. Yeah, but that's human wisdom. When it comes to God's wisdom, Paul is writing to say, embrace God's wisdom. The world says it's foolishness, but we are to embrace God's wisdom. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Now listen, in this congregation, there are some brilliant people. Some of you are brilliant at what you do. There are individuals, when you try to describe what you do for a living, you lose me. I have no clue what you're talking about. I don't care. I was out at the meat shop. I'm, I'm looking at them cutting up meat. I'm like, I don't know what you're doing. I'd be like, hack, cut, chop. Thank you. Now you have to throw the whole thing away because you ruined it. Get him out of here. Okay? So when you function in, in whatever role, some of you in military, in, in different ways, and your minds and what you understand and what you can process through in your field, I can't track with you. So is Paul saying that that's a waste and that's pointless of the brilliance you have? Listen to how John Calvin explained this 500 years ago. I think it's helpful. He says this, The apostle does not require that we should altogether renounce the wisdom that is implanted in us by nature or acquired by long practice, but simply, here it is, that we subject it to the service of God so as to have no wisdom but through his word. So if God has given you talent, ability, wisdom, smarts, brain power, he has done so for your good and for his glory. That your intelligence, your mind, your study, your dedication, discipline is useful to those around you. It's good. But it is with this that it is subject to the service of God. It's for his purpose, ultimately. The gospel displayed perfectly in Christ is God's supreme display of wisdom. Why? Because the gospel completely strips away our human ability to come to God on our own terms. It's not a how-to list. Never do we come under the teaching of the Word of God and I hand you a to-do list, a how-to-be-saved list. It doesn't exist. Always the gospel is, this is what God has done for sinners. And if sinners will repent and trust in Christ alone, he will take them on that basis and adopt them, forgive them, redeem them, and make them his child. Done deal. That's the gospel. To the world, that's foolishness. Are you kidding me? Do you know, my dad was a pastor. Oh, I've been in church all the time. Oh, I've, I've done this. I meet people who are like, oh, I have degrees in that, and I've studied this, and where are you in church? Nowhere. Well, what good is that? What are you doing with that? What are you trusting in for your salvation? You see, this is the paradox of true Christianity. In the kingdom of God, the way to life, Jesus said, is found in dying to self. You have to die to live, Luke chapter 9. Let him deny himself, take up his cross. And by the way, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Where's the gain in that? The only way to greatness is found in serving. Jesus said, yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Matthew 20, 26. Luke 13, 30, there are the last who will be, no, 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 you're first. And then there are people like, ooh, I am first. Do you know who I am and how many books I wrote and how many programs? I, I was famous. And they will be last. The way up is down. The way of exaltation is through humility. Psalm 147, 6 and James 4, 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what's the promise? He will lift you up. But see, if you come into the presence of the God who spoke and created all things and you're filled with self, idolatry, he will put you down. Because that's rejecting his provision, which is Christ. And when was the last time somebody spit in your son's face and you just said, oh, come here, shucks, you're such a nice. No. You probably would be more offended if they spit in your child's face than if they spit in your face. 
rejecting your child is intense. Paul grounds this teaching and his application, and he grounds it in Scripture. You see this in verse nine, verses 19 and 20 here in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And then here it is, for it is written. He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And right there, that's a quote from Job. So Paul is giving us the canonicity of Job. Job belongs in the Bible. He catches the wise in their own craftiness. Do, do you, are you tempted to think that God is somewhere removed and he, like he owes you? There are a lot of people who think that. Well, if, if God is, is real and he lets this happen and he lets that suffering happen and he lets that injustice go on, then I just don't need a God and I won't worship a God like that. That's human wisdom against God's wisdom who created all things and allowed us to spit on his son and pull the beard out of his son and shred the back and body of his son. And we sit quickly in judgment of this God who created all things and owes us nothing. And Job says, he catches, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. Their argument runs out. It runs dry. And again, verse 20, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. This is the worldly wise. This is the person using worldly human wisdom philosophy. They don't really have use for scripture. They are futile, pointless. They won't bring fruit. It won't last. And you read of the accounts of those who live out lives apart from God and how they face death. It's not peaceful. Number three, Paul leads us right here. This is the issue he's getting to. Do not idolize human leaders. Do not idolize human leaders. Why does he have to say that? Because they were. They were. You ever walked into a church where the pastor, who is currently the pastor and has a huge mural of himself out on a wall? Like, oh, wow, are we supposed to, you know, bow down or sort of leave some flowers here at the... Okay, they were idolizing these different groups in the church, and Paul's already dealt with it in the first chapter. And so once there's splits in the church, then everything gets sidelined because no one's thinking about whoever's preaching. They're off on a tangent. It's like trying to drive a car, and you just, just one tire is out of balance. <laughs> Have a good trip. Do, 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 do. Till that thing flies off and goes down the road, and suddenly your trip is taking on a whole new element of surprise. Therefore, let no one boast in men. Here we see the problem of giving glory to the wrong being. It's this can be done in marriage. You know, you buy into the you complete me, you know? Says the one man to the woman, or the woman to the man. No, there's no human being that will complete you. That's God. So whenever you give a position that belongs to God, to a person, a human being, you can be guaranteed there's going to be problems. It's, it's going to, when you want, you know, well, my husband needs to do this and do that and do this and, and, and he should do that. And if he would do all that, then I would be happy. Or my wife, if she would, and then, and then well, if my kids, and if they would do this, that is expecting something from a person that God alone can fill in you. So when I have my need met, my greatest need met by God, then that enables me and puts me in a disposition that I'm able to serve and not live to be served. And you owe me. That's not grace. That's choking of a relationship. Well, you know, seven years ago, you... I mean, I still tease my wife about driving into the car and hitting the mirror. But it's funny. I think it's funny. She doesn't think it's so funny. We laugh about it. That car is long gone. It's probably in a trash compactor somewhere. It's probably been recycled already. But here's the problem. 
when you get so mad over something that is passing, fading, and you say things that you can't take back, and you're hurtful over what? Something? And you'll ruin a person and a relationship over something, stuff? We could easily be self-deceived. That's what they were doing with these leaders. And beloved, what you idolize, you will one day demonize. Because if you're your spouse, they just don't do it, then and, and I gave them chances and I gave them chances and they haven't met my need, then wham comes the anger. Herod, I would murder if I could get away with it. And it comes where? From the heart. You must know, I have to have you know this, that pastors and leaders that God places in your life are for your good and for his glory. And here's where Paul returns to his previous thought. These people in Corinth were split. They were under this guy, under this guy, under that guy, and it was causing, it was wreaking havoc in the church. So beware of any spiritual leader that is, has little regard for the Word of God. You watch them, you know, you're homesick from church or you're on the road or you see it come up and you see the guy and the Bible is not centrally. Here's a verse and on they go with talking for the next 30 minutes. Beware. Beware of any spiritual leader that has little regard for the Word of God and what do they then rely on? Personality. They rely on popularity or they rely on their opinion. And it's not grounded in Scripture. Do not put your trust in man. Listen to this quote from Calvin. As there is nothing that is more vain than man, how little security there is in leaning upon an evanescent shadow. If you put your trust in man, he's saying you're putting your trust in a shadow. And how long do shadows last? Why would you put your trust in a passing cloud or your breath and you breathe in in the cold air? Why would you put your trust in that? He's saying that's like putting your trust in a man. No, 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 no. Put your trust in Scripture. That will keep you from the death grip of legalism. That will keep you from the death grip of trying to keep up with the law and the standards and everyone's expectations. No, stick to the Word of God. And in Corinth, they were having some serious troubles. Be thankful for God's instruments of grace throughout your life that have encouraged you in the gospel. Knowing Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So Paul is taking them back to truth, brings us to the fourth exhortation. Gratefully recognize that God has provided all things for you in Christ. Beloved, This gospel text right here is vividly displayed in what we're celebrating in this Christmas season. When you hear this, when you hear Paul reminding the Corinthians who you are, who you belong to, who owns everything, and what he's done for you, I'm praying that you don't ever live the same. This changes you. This grows you up. This gives you some some strength in your legs spiritually that you can stand knowing who you belong to. Who owns you? In Christ, we have been given all things. So we know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, what? Gave his only begotten son. He didn't give a leftover angel. He gave his only son. That was the plan of redemption from before anything was ever made. That's love. He gave his only son. And so because he gave, we give. Pastor Jamie talked about that. When you're giving gifts, when you're receiving gifts, let that remind you. Don't let it be all about the gift. And this gift is going to make me happy. No, it's not. It won't fit anyway. And it's going to be out of style in six months anyhow. And the weather's going to change and you can't wear it anymore. And all that, you know, that's all stuff. So keep it in perspective of we give because you. I love you. You love me, and we give gifts because God has given the greatest gift that we can't fathom and comprehend. 
Scriptures that expand our understanding of this wealth graciously bestowed on believers. Paul says, all things are yours. Think about this. What belongs to God? What does he own? Everything. Okay, so that's why you can't earn your salvation. What are you going to give him? What are you going to bribe him with? Well, Lord, you know I... What? I'm breathing his air. I'm walking his earth. Everything I have is from him. How am I going to pay him off? Sing? No. Nope. It takes me in the... No I go negative on that one. You know? It's, Shut up. No, you're losing ground. Quiet. What am I going to do? 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. How is he able to share this with you? Because he left heaven, he was rich. He wasn't Donald Trump rich. He wasn't Bill Gates rich. He wasn't Steve Jobs rich. He owned it all. He's always owned it. He owns it now, and he will forever own it rich. He's not a mere mortal that lives and dies. He's God. It's all his. And what has he done in Christ? He left it all, and in the incarnation, he lived the life that we cannot live. He died the death that we deserve to die, and he rose to give us life that we can never earn. To make you rich. Money? Cars? Uh-uh. That's small time. That's nothing. All things given to you in Christ. He became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Ephesians 2, 7, that in, why? Okay, so here's what you're thinking. Well, is this, is this like a sleight of the hand? Is he done this because he, oh, now you owe me, wise. You owe me. That's what he wants to do. He's really trying to trick me. Oh, here, just sign this and sign that. And at the bottom, oh, you signed it. <laughs> okay, you just signed over your children and your house. And, uh, whoa, let me read that again. Too late, you signed it. Is that what God is doing here? Is there a little slide of the hand, a little deception? Why would he, he's rich, he leaves it all, becomes poor, so that he can make us rich. Why? For this lifetime, like the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, so we can have, you know, the nice car, the nice house, and health and wealth and happiness? Is that why? Nope, that's too short. It's too small. It's too insignificant. Listen, Ephesians 2, 7, here's why that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you're just getting a little appetizer right now of his grace and goodness. It's just a small little glimpse of how good he is in Christ that he's purchased for you salvation and redemption. And he's just given us like you do when you get the little kids and, and you take the little tiny plastic spoon that they can't, you know, hurt themselves with. And you're just giving them a little taste knowing in a few years there's a big old banquet spread out here, but you're going to be in nap time and pretty soon you're not even going to know we're eating or care. In this lifetime, what he's done to make us rich, but in all of eternity, he's going to lavish on his people his riches. And how is that possible? Christ Jesus. It's possible in Christ. That's how. Ephesians 3.8. To me, Paul says, who am less than all the least of all the saints. Wow, that's a note of humility. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Dollars, Paul? No. Inheritance, Christ, who is God's. They own it all. And he wants to share it with whoever will humble themselves and become a fool and empty themselves of human wisdom and trust in Christ alone. And he says, it's all yours. That's a good God. Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's the only way. God's supply. It's by Christ. It's by what he has done. Colossians 1.27, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is it, Paul? which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
So you're going to see joy. I mean, that's on our thing right here. Joy. Some of you, Satan's going to mess with you, and you'll be like, joy. I'm not, I'm not. I'm running short on money right now. The kids aren't doing what my husband, joy. They want joy. Here, go to church with me, joyless man. You know, joy. Okay? How joy. And you see, hope. Hope. And you might be really struggling right now with joy. And I'm not feeling the joy and hope. And I'm, I'm living life with some other people. And this is getting pretty crazy right now. And where's the hope? Then where do our eyes need to be fixed? It's, it's, on, it's on Christ. I need this message as much as you need this message. Not to put our trust in men. Because men will let you down. In Christ, Romans 10 says, whoever's trusted in him will never, ever, 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 ever be disappointed. And you can't say that about any human being you know. Because at one time or another, you've disappointed others and they've disappointed you. There's one person who's never disappointed anyone. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. This true wealth is only accessible by God's grace in understanding and receiving the gospel. You see that in Ephesians chapter 2. So Paul is saying, he's saying, listen, the leaders, and you're all divided up under the leaders, he said, the leaders are all yours. How are you dividing up under leaders when they're all yours? That's like me fighting with myself over a $20 bill in my wallet. Like I, I, I need to have more and cut it up into pieces. Now I have four. No, you don't. You just mess it up. Well, I really taught myself a lesson there. Okay, so Paul goes back into this. He says, Paul, Apollos, Cephas. But wait a second. That's from chapter one, and he left out the fourth groups. Oh, we're of Paul. Oh, we're of Apollos. Great speaker he is. And Peter, man, that guy, he walked on water. I don't know, he went under a little bit, but Jesus pulled him up. Everybody else was in the boat. Peter's our guy. And remember, there was a fourth group. We're, we're Christ's group. And Paul here, if you're there in 1 Corinthians 3, 22, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or, and w w wait a second, Paul, you should be saying, or Christ, right? That's the problem in Corinth. They were divided up under leaders who weren't dividing them. They were dividing up under them. But he doesn't mention Jesus there. And he goes into this list, or world, or life, or death. He goes into, and then he comes down to it later, and you are Christ. You're all Christ. Lining up under a Christian teacher against another Christian teacher is absolutely and entirely illogical. It makes no sense. Why? Because they're all Christ. So when Christians divide up under leaders, it's making moronic what is beautiful in the body of Christ. Let me try to explain this by using an analogy in the home. All right. The husband, his lawnmower, his tractor is just not getting it done anymore. So he sees the sale, he goes out, and he buys the tractor, and he comes home, and his wife says, well, what you got there? Oh, that tractor, it was on sale. I saved $5,000 on that tractor. It doesn't sound good to her yet. How much did you spend on that tractor? Oh, it was only $15,000 for that tractor, and it came with the optional equipment. You didn't talk about that. What? We don't have money for that. Oh, don't worry, it's 0% interest for like 12 months. Okay. So the wife then says, hmm, I'm tired of my kitchen stuff. She goes down to the appliance store. Here comes the truck backing in the driveway. Beep, beep, beep. And the husband says, what's being delivered? I'm tired of all that kitchen stuff in there. If I'm going to cook... I saved a lot of money. We got a whole new set. They're going to put it in. How much did you spend on it? It's twelve thousand dollars. We don't have that kind of money. Yeah, we didn't have it for the tractor either. Now they're at a standoff. Now you got the teenage kid. It's like you know, I don't really like my car. No, we don't have money for a new car. I got an idea. Right into the ditch totals the car. Ha <laughs> ha! Now I have to have a new car. Who's paying the price in all of this mayhem? It's the family. They're all part of the same family. They're doing each other in. What they're doing is hurting themselves because they all 
They're all wearing the same last name. They all share this. They're part of the same family. They're hurting each other. That's not the way a Christian family should operate. It's not the way any family should operate. There should be, here's our budget. Here's where we are. We talk about this. We're in this together. We work on this together because we are in the same family. And in a church, I'm of Paul. Oh, I'm of Paulus. Oh, I'm of Cephas. You're all in the same family. And Paul is writing to them, dear idiots. No, can't say that. Dear saints of God, is what he comes up with, right? If, he, if I was right, I'd be like, you fools. He doesn't say that, but he does say, let no one deceive you. And he's saying it's time to get off the foolish wagon and wise up according to Scripture and understand, do you realize who owns you? He says it's not just the leaders that God's given to you. And it's appropriate to show gratitude. And it's, we're not talking about we're unthankful for leaders. He's saying you don't worship the leaders. You don't put the leaders in such a category that they are, you want them to do for you what Jesus alone can do for you. That's the point. I can't forgive you and I can't be perfect enough for you. That's Jesus. So whenever people want a human leader to be Jesus, that is idolatry. That is legalism. And Paul is saying to them, stop it. You're all belonging to Christ. Your leaders belong to Christ. And Christ, it's all yours. Look at this. Read it again. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the things present or the things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God. Boom. Boom. You're all belonging to God. You belong to him. Paul said for, and to, the, to the Romans, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now, this message is a message of great joy to all people. Because, listen, beloved, neither myself nor you, none of us belong. None of us deserve to be in this family. None of us deserve to belong in this family. You can't look in the mirror and say, now that person, yeah, of course I understand why the Lord would come and leave his riches and get poor and die and suffer for me. Come on. No. If you're honest with yourself for one second, you will know my thought life is, and my actions and my attitudes and my motivations and my lack, oh, Lord, forgive me, have mercy on me. And then you look into this and you say, do you realize that the leaders he's given to you, they're all Christ and all is Christ and life and death. Think about that. The life, the whole world, the whole ordered universe. That's where you get away from just money and stuff and health and wealth. No, the whole thing is for you. Life, abundant life that Jesus talked about. Death, death is just a shadow for a believer. Death, the stinger is gone. All of it's gone. And death is an usher. Okay, life, presence of the Lord. I'm death, nice to meet you. For a believer, that's what death becomes. It becomes a servant to believers to usher us into the presence of God. Things present, things to come. It's all of it. This is his great love and mercy. So here's the question. Do you own this king? At that Christmas carol, we're going to sing at Christmas Eve. What child is this? Come peasant king to own him. Think about this. To own him. Do you own this king? And then I have another question for you. Does he own you? Because if you own him, he owns you. And when you read that, you are Christ. Then you say, wait a second. Does my life demonstrate that I am his? Do I serve in a way that reflects I'm his and he is mine? Don't be fooled by the deceptiveness of human wisdom. Humbly embrace the foolishness of God's wisdom. Do not idolize human leaders and gratefully recognize that God has provided all things for you in Christ. So the question that we ought not to ask is, am I a fool? Everybody is someone's fool. The question that you and I have to answer is, whose fool am I? If you are a fool for Christ then everything is yours. Life, death, things present, things to come. It's all yours in Christ. Purchase at the cross. But if you are a fool for Satan, 
He's the thief who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he has taken down so many people, and he wants to take you down. Whose fool are you? And I'm praying that today, if you've never repented and trusted in Jesus Christ alone, that today you'll say, here I am, Lord. Take me. I give myself to you. Here I am. Admit your sinfulness. Believe in Christ. Confess him as Lord. Will you stand with me? We are going to close by singing the hymn, All I Have is Christ. And I would pray that if this isn't your testimony yet, it will be. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for these dear folks who are gathered here today. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the power of Jesus Christ that he raised from the dead to give us life. Father, I pray that you will work in the hearts of all who are here, faith in Christ Jesus. Father, if we have Christ, we have all that we need. But if we do not have Christ, we are bankrupt forever. And if a person dies in that condition, they will be separated from you for all eternity. So I pray that if there is one here today, they would hear this call, this invitation to come to Jesus, all who are weary and heavy laden, and there they will find rest. And it's only found in Christ alone. For Jesus' sake, amen.